On the 25th of December, I published part one of a three part series on Starmerism. I briefly spoke about Keir's upbringing, touched on Keir's time as head of the CPS, and highlighted what enabled Keir to be elected leader of the Labour Party by the membership at the time. It was a good video, you should check it out. Link in the description below. In this video, I will take the opportunity to appreciate the lengths to Keir Rodney Starmer travelled in order to rid the Labour Party of anti-Semitic poison and return the party to its anti-racist roots after the Corbyn years. Anyone that watched the last video would have noticed Keir giving tacit approval to Israel's right to commit war crimes. He draws the line at tolerating any form of bigotry under his stewardship, or does he? Probably not, but it should go without saying that anti-Semitism is one of the oldest forms of hate and should not be given space to spread in any civilised society. The media would have you believe that the wave of anti-Jewish hate seen in the 2010s began and stopped with Jeremy Corbyn's almost five year tenure as Labour leader. But the internet is free and information debunking this narrative can be found if you know where to look. There is this small obscure website called Wikipedia that suggests anti-Semitism has been in the UK since 1070, resulting in a series of massacres on several occasions and the expulsion from the country in 1290. With Oliver Cromwell, of all people, welcoming back the community with open arms in 1655, that must have been to offset all the Irish people he brutalised between 1649 and 1653. So let's just say the UK is true to this and not new to this anti-Semitism thing. And I think it is safe to say that anti-Semitism affects every level of society, with elected members of parliament being a lightning rod for this specific type of hate. Former House of Commons speaker John Burko has spoken about receiving anti-Semitic abuse from Conservative members and never facing any from Labour members. I myself have never experienced anti-Semitism from a member of the Labour Party, point one. And point two, though there is a big issue and it has to be addressed, I do not myself believe Jeremy Corbyn is anti-Semitic. But he could be biased because he is a liberal. When it comes to facing anti-Semitic abuse as an elected Jewish politician, very few have had more documented experience than Luciana Berger, the former Labour MP turned Change UK member turned Liberal Democrat hopeful turned Labour Party member again, has sent not one but two fascists to prison for racist abuse. 21 year old Garen Helm also had Nazi paraphernalia in his home and Joshua got sent to prison for trying to defend the honour of his Nazi mate. This all happened after a man was fined for hurling anti-Semitic abuse at Luciana. Music promoter Phil was quoted as saying he hated Jewish people to Luciana's face. It was also found that Luciana received 2,500 racist tweets in three days back in 2014 and called on Twitter to ban racist words, which was echoed by Labour leader at the time, Ed Miliband. In that same Luciana Guardian article, it writes, a spokesman for Twitter told the paper the firm was working hard to combat abuse, but blocking individual words was ineffective at stopping unwanted behaviour. Thank God Twitter was purchased by the free speech absolutist Space Karen, better known by Elon Musk. At least now X doesn't have to pretend to care about online abuse. Elon rolled out the red carpet for Donald Trump's return to the platform. Elon has created a platform where you can say and do anything unless you support Palestine. Elon has encouraged so much toxicity, he had to make a trip to Israel while they were in the middle of trying to wipe Gaza off the map to apologize for platforming anti-Semitic posts. A 2017 anti-Semitism barometer commissioned by the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism found that 30% of supporters of the Liberal Democrats endorsed at least one anti-Semitic attitude, as defined by the CAA. Compared with 32% of Labour supporters, 39% of UK Independent Party supporters and 40% of Conservative Party supporters. In that same survey, British Jewish people were asked, do you feel that any political parties are too tolerant of anti-Semitism among their MPs, members and supporters? Looking at the year 2017 in the blue, 83% believed it was a Labour Party, 
with 19% for the Conservative Party. The Tories were less than the Lib Dems and Green Party. The Green Party was even 1% below UKIP. You couldn't make it up, especially since the survey already said that 32% of Labour members endorsed at least one anti-Semitic statement compared to the Tories and Lib Dems on 40% and 30% respectively. The report explained the discontent showed by British Jewish people was due to the way Labour very publicly failed to robustly deal with the anti-Semites in its ranks. And the Labour Party has fallen out of step with its core supporters who are generally less likely to hold anti-Semitic beliefs. Yeah. Channel 4 Fact Check said to beware cherry picking stats from single studies into topics like this, whoever you are, and advised that most British Jewish people supported the Conservative Party, which could explain the massive difference in discontentment between the Labour Party and Tory Party. Following the CAA Commission, the House of Commons Home Affairs Committee published a report titled Anti-Semitism in the UK. And let's just say I have some comments in the key facts section they chose to reference the same caa survey figures it's so good to see our elected members of parliament cherry pick stats something channel 4 told people not to do just above that fact they chose to include a survey of labor party members who joined after the 2015 general election found that 55 percent agreed with the notion that anti-semitism is not a serious problem at all and is being hyped up to undermine Labour and Jeremy Corbyn or to stifle legitimate criticism of Israel. I personally struggle with this entry because it doesn't mean this 55% don't believe anti-Semitism is a problem in society generally or they even believe in at least one anti-Semitic trope or attitude. So it's strange to put it in a list of facts that also feature police informed the Labour MP Luciana Berger that she received over 2,500 abusive tweets in just three days. Despite the report explaining way down on page 46, other political parties have not been immune to accusations of anti-Semitism albeit apparently with a smaller number of reported incidents and with a lower profile. What an amazing sequence of words. A smaller number of reported incidents. Remember kids, just because something wasn't reported doesn't mean it didn't happen. And just because something was reported doesn't mean it did happen. Moving on, this report admits to a heavy focus on the Labour Party when it writes, no party is immune to bad apples and it would be naive to assume that tackling anti-Semitism in the Labour Party would eliminate it from political discourse altogether. Anti-Semitism is a problem of such gravity that no party can afford to be complacent. It is an issue that should transcend party loyalties and inner party conflict. Labour leader at the time, Jeremy Corbyn, temporarily suspended Labour MP Now Shah and former Labour politician Ken Livingston all faced a heavy amount of scrutiny. It's crazy to see all other political parties being treated as footnotes in the report. The Tory party, where 40% of their members believe that at least one anti-Semitic statement was only mentioned in passing. It does mention that a Tory candidate for Derby Council referred to Ed Miliband as the Jew. It's claimed that a member of the Conservative Society at University College London said, Jews own everything. We all know it's true. I wish I was Jewish, but my nose isn't long enough. And a Lib Dem politician that defected from the Tories tweeted that Lib Dem leader Tim Farron was funded by London Jews. In total, they spent eight pages on the Labour Party and three pages on everyone else. The report even writes, it is very disappointing that the Conservative Party procrastinated for so long and that both the leader and chairman of the party declined to give evidence on this vital issue. But yeah, it was the Labour Party that didn't take anti-Semitism seriously at the time. This would have been the moment in the video I would have heavily quoted the Wikipedia page anti-semitism in the UK Conservative Party but it was created in 2019 which means the public wouldn't have had easy access to a centralization of Tory anti-semitic behavior 
since the formation of the party at the time of this report being published in 2016. Anti-Semitism in the UK Labour Party was created in 2017. Make of that what you will. But I will say that even today, Wikipedia acknowledges the Tory party has had a longer and more profound negative impact on the Jewish community than the Labour Party, with incidents stretching back to 1834 for the Tories and 1899 for the Labour Party. Anyway, I would recommend you read the 68 page report yourself to make up your own mind. To show how much time I have in life, I spotted a mistake on page 20. In their haste to show that we are the least anti-Semitic country in Europe despite a 4% rise during the time period discussed, someone forgot to ensure the text matched the graphics. The text says the difference was particularly stark in France where the figures dropped from 27% to 16%. Now France did have the biggest shift in opinion but those figures quoted in the text represent Germany not France. One thing to highlight about anti-semitism and the Labour Party, people accuse Jeremy Corbyn of being a catalyst for Jewish members leaving the party. However, Jewish people were already leaving while Ed Miliband was leader. Within the Jewish Chronicles article, a click in a search of the Ed photo brings up pianos for some reason. Jews defection not because of Ed, says Labour. It is asserted that Jewish donors were leaving because of Ed's response to the Gaza conflict. Not the 2023 conflict conflict but the six week conflict in 2014. Just look at those numbers for a moment. So, Ed simply denounced Israel's offensive towards the Palestinian people at the time and people were irked. Man, whatever happened to that Ed? Anyway, Labour's reason for the decline in support was to suggest the Jewish community had been moving away from the Labour Party for more than a decade, with one unnamed source saying that the supporters that remained with Ed Miliband were pissed off because he backed a vote urging the UK government to recognise Palestinian statehood. And as you can see from this quote, Maureen Lippmann was very pissed off. I just love where it reads, in steps Mr Miliband, and I just imagine Ed being a clumsy clone of Mr Bean. Anyway, while researching this topic, I found a Financial Times piece titled British Jews ambivalent about a Miliband win. I couldn't review the content because giving money to the Financial Times. A 2015 Spectator article, Jews Against Miliband, asked why the Jewish community was more likely to back the Tories despite the chance to elect the second Jewish Prime Minister after Benjamin Disraeli. They used this picture for the article, which is crazy to me. The article speaks about Ed's grandmother that lived in Israel and how his parents narrowly escaped the Nazis. The article then seems to relish in the fact that an image of Ed was booed at a dinner for a firm that provided security for Jewish venues. It also suggested that things had got this bad for Ed because he didn't know what it meant to be Jewish because his parents chose to raise him by political beliefs and not Jewish identity. It suggested that this supposed cultural gap meant that Ed only cared about Palestinians dying and not anti-Semitic attacks doubling in the UK at the time. Again, the piece cited Ed action to whip his MPs to support a motion of backing unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state as another reason the Jewish community disliked him. Going as far as quoting a unnamed community activist as saying they have been forced to choose between their party and their support for Israel in a way they never thought they would be when referring to members of the Jewish community that traditionally voted Labour. The article rounds off by writing the Jewish community were voting in a homogenous block before, saying they were left wing by voting for Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair's new Labour, which made my head explode. Then I reassembled my head to read that a poll found that 69% of the Jewish community intended to vote Tory a month out from the 2015 general election. And this wasn't included in the written script, but I just had to say something. If this article was written by a non-Jewish person, I would be suggesting right now that it is an anti-Semitic bonfire. Robert Philpott really knows how to weave a tangled web. To suggest that Ed Miliband prioritizing 
Palestinian human rights over Israel's right to drop bombs on their heads is somehow a display of his disconnection with his Jewish self is very anti-Semitic. And to imply that this disconnection with the Jewish community was somehow driven by Ralph Miliband's own hatred of his Jewish identity is anti-Semitic. To assume that a Jewish friend or fellow member takes a particular position on politics in general or on Israel and on Palestine in particular is just wrong. And I would even suggest that it is indeed anti-Semitic. It's clear to see that I believe that this article is very badly written, but it's nothing compared to this vile Daily Mail anti-Semitic hit piece. And I say this knowing that it was written by Jewish writer Jeffrey Levy. Within this article, Ralph Miliband is painted as being ungrateful after the UK gave him safe haven after fleeing the Nazis in Belgium. All because he wrote these words in a journal as a 17 year old boy. The Englishman is a rabid nationalist. They are perhaps the most nationalist people in the world. You sometimes want them to almost lose to show them how things are. They have the greatest contempt for the continent. To lose their empire would be the worst possible humiliation. I'm trying my hardest to detect the lie shown from that 17 year old boy. Since then, the UK has left the European Union and UK immigration processing centres have been firebombed by vigilante fascists. This silly little article also makes false claims of hypocrisy because both of Ralph Miliband's sons went to Oxford University. Heaven forbid anybody wants their children to attend a high quality education establishment. Also highlighting the fact that this family passed on their one family house to their two sons in a way that avoided death duties hardly the crime of the century but you get the point it's just a stupid little article that conveniently leaves out the fact that Ralph Miliband actually served in the Royal Navy during World War II and instead this article did its very best to try and paint Ralph Miliband as some type of fifth columnist trying to bring down the state of Britain for the Soviet Union maybe you know your bog standard anti-communist rhetoric the article is titled in bold the man who hated Britain a completely unhinged and deranged title even by the Daily Mail standards but apart from the attempted character assassination this article made me aware of quotes from a Ralph Miller band book that makes me want to go out and buy it I mean just look at this banger of a quote how does this quote which was written in a 1969 book not speak about the dominance of Amazon today I think it's amazing that he hated Margaret Thatcher and the Falklands War and it's safe to say that he perfectly described the Labour Party then and now under Sakir Rodney Starmer. My overall review of this particular Daily Mail article is that I hope Jeffrey Levy never has a good day going forward. May he have bad luck for the rest of his life. And I do not condone or advocate violence. But if I was Ed Miliband or David Miliband, I would be inviting Jeffrey to a closed gym workout for what he said about their father who wasn't alive to defend himself. And I bet you'll never guess who was the first person who came out in defense of Ralph Miliband. Yep, it's everyone's favorite jam maker. The idea that you could attack somebody because of their father's views who is already dead and then use such ludicrous language such as he hated Britain, was an enemy of Britain and all this stuff. I mean, come on, Ralph Miliband was a refugee, came to Britain, made it his home, studied at Acton Technical College, went to university and achieved an incredible academic career and went in the Royal Navy, risked his life, survived happily and um, then to be denounced in these lurid terms uh, is appalling but also the timing is interesting and I think it's backfired badly on the Daily Mail and the writer because uh, people will see through this very very quickly for what it is a cheap attack on somebody's father. Man how can you not love that guy? always came out swinging for the best people. Anyway, back to the scripted portion of this video. I say all of this to challenge the notion that anti-Semitism rose in the UK and the Jewish community started leaving the Labour Party when Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader. Moving on, that brings us to Keir Starmer and his response to elements of anti-Semitism within the Labour membership. An issue he didn't see as systemic in a 2019 interview. I don't think Labour is institutionally anti-Semitic. I'm really sad to see people like David Treisman go. Um, and I know it's not just 
It's safe to say Sakura Di Starmer did a complete 180 on that thinking and within days of taking up the Labour leadership in 2020 he was pledging to rid the Labour Party of this issue something which was praised by Jewish leaders. This particular crusade has definitely defined Keir Starmer's time as leader of the Labour Party. In January 2023 with Mr Starmer even taking the time to say the ex-leadership let hate spread within Labour. Now I'm not 100% sure whether that time Sir Keir Starmer had COVID, it completely destroyed his brain's capacity to store memories, but Keir Starmer was a part of the ex-leadership. He even acknowledges it here. Um, we have made some changes, but we've still got a problem. Um, I actually don't think pointing to a particular individual is right here. There's collective leadership. One of the reasons I've said the Shadow Cabinet needs to be fully informed, we need to have a full discussion in the Shadow Cabinet, is because we've got a shared responsibility to do something about this. I would rather join with others in the leadership team and across the party uh, to deal with this than to um, sort of say it's uh, the fault of X, Y or Z. It would seem that Sir Keir Starmer is definitely blaming X, Y and Z today. Anyway, it would seem that the powers that be outside of the Labour Party are happy by the progress made by Sir Keir Rodney Starmer in his attempt to tackle anti-Semitism within the party membership. Within the Financial Times article titled UK Equalities Watchdog Satisfied with Labour Action on Antisemitism, we are given the following quote. On the 31st of January 2023, we concluded our monitoring as we were satisfied that the party had implemented the necessary actions to improve its complaints, recruitment, training and other procedures to the legal standards required. The quote continues with, this will help to protect current and future Labour Party members from discrimination and harassment. Implementing a full process is really good, something that Jeremy Corbyn has already acknowledged. I supported the rule changes in the party. I'd already implemented changes. And bear in mind, when I became leader, there was no proper process for dealing with behaviour of party members. There was no way of dealing with these disciplinary matters. But I guess Sir Keir Rodney Starmer acknowledges things to the power of 50? I don't know. But the plot definitely begins to thicken. Because while the Equality and Human Rights Commission were giving Keir Starmer a gold star for all his work, others were concerned what this meant in terms of practical matters. Especially when you take into consideration the pledge of zero tolerance on anti-semitism and racism within the Labour Party. Renowned senior lawyer Martin Ford, who carried out an inquiry into the party's culture and published the infamous Ford report, asked how the Labour Party would in fact implement this zero tolerance when there is no transparency and the disciplinary process is not carried out by an independent body. Again, even Jeremy Corbyn said this is something that needs to be put in place. And what I said was, this is a nonsensical way of running a political party. There has to be a separation of the processes between the political leadership of the leader's office and a proper process of dealing with things. Independence, if you like, of a judicial system. I just, want to ask I just imagine the current Labour Party disciplinary process is sticking the accused member into an x-ray machine and investigating whether they have a single anti-Semitic or racist bone in their body. Because I can't think of any other reason why you just wouldn't be transparent about the whole process. Forgive me if I sound really, 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 really sceptical of what is happening currently within the Labour Party. I just feel that Keir Starmer over-promised and is currently under-delivering. And I truly believe Jeremy Corbyn would have been able to experience felt anti-semitism from the party if he was given a chance especially when almost four years ago a leaked document reported that hostility to Corbyn her labor efforts to tackle anti-semitism we don't know who wrote the 860 page report but we know it was done in the last few months of Jeremy Corbyn's time as labor leader also the report was examined in detail by the Al Jazeera investigation series the labor files more on them later the leaking of this document resulted in Labour taking five ex-staff members to court for the alleged act of leaking. But costs have apparently climbed to the eye-watering £1.5 million, which has forced Labour to want to delay until after 
the next general election. And it's just really funny to me that Labour would rather focus on the actions of alleged leakers than genuinely investigate whether sabotage was the true cause of Labour not being able to get a grip of the anti-Semitism problem. And in a cruel twist of fate, Labour's lack of transparency and independence over its disciplinary process has resulted in some very strange outcomes indeed. But I guess I should ignore the left-wing Jewish activists that have been expelled from the Labour Party party for anti-semitism but maybe i'm wrong maybe these expulsions were due to genuine cases of anti-semitic behavior but i will never know because we're not given any insight into how a decision has actually been made and this is also covered in the labor files in great detail and since this is the second time i'm mentioning the labor files i better give a quick overview for those that don't know about them the original labor files series was a four-part series from al jazeera investigations published on the al jazeera English Channel in September and October 2022. The series featured videos lasting from 21 minutes up to 1 hour and 24 minutes. In release order they were titled The Purge, The Crisis, The Hierarchy and The Spine Games. And let me just share with you some of the excerpts from the descriptions featured under each video. The Purge will show how officials set about silencing, excluding and expelling its own members in a ruthless campaign to destroy the chances of Jeremy Corbyn becoming Britain's Prime Minister. The crisis uncovers the true story behind the crisis of anti-Semitism that engulfed the British Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. It made him appear unfit to govern and led to a crushing electoral defeat. The hierarchy reveals how a British political party that claims to embrace progressive values created a hierarchy of racism that discriminated against its black, Asian and Muslim members. The spying game tells the sinister story of how the Labour Party used hacked data from a journalist to investigate their own members who were critical of the party. Despite questionable ethical and legal issues and with the knowledge of party leadership, the hacked emails were used as evidence to discipline Labour councillors and activists in the London borough. And I would encourage you to watch the entire series yourself. Links to the videos in the description below. And I think I might return to the Labour files later in this video but in the meantime i would just like to reflect on something Sakir Rodney Starmer did in the election campaign he took the anxieties and fears of Labour members with opposing views it should go without saying that Labour is a very big tent i mean any party that can include both money hungry capitalists slash bloodthirsty warmonger tony blair and a key person within the stop the war coalition who used to wear jumpers knitted by his own mother to parliament volunteer to feed the homeless on christmas day and continues to make his own jam jeremy corbyn means your party probably has a tent the size of tenerife and keir starmer being a cunning fox knew all of this and considered in the fact he saw everything that happened with the anti-semitism row Keir knew he could not win the Labour membership if he even attempted to pander to one faction actually now that I have said that out loud that statement is a complete inaccuracy because Keir Starmer definitely pandered to both sides admittedly pandering a lot more to the supporters of Jeremy Corbyn because they had a much larger presence within the Labour Party membership and he could never get elected leader without their backing so as it was already mentioned in part one of this series, Keir Starmer presented himself as the respectable version of Corbynism. But Keir still made sure that he mentioned all of the work Labour did under Tony Blair. What I should have said is that Keir ensured that he didn't say anything to alienate the left or right wing of the Labour Party. Instead, Keir presented himself as a man of peace, love and forgiveness, but most importantly, unity. I think the whole of the party wants to be united. They want to come together. So we have to end factionalism. After winning the election in an apparent landslide, Keir Starmer had the option of walking down one of two paths. The first one being everything he echoed within his leadership campaign, repairing the severed relationship between the right wing and the left wing of the party, providing an environment where everyone felt welcome. This includes Labour members, MPs and staffers, offering a a true alternative to the Tories in policy and galvanising the biggest political party membership in Europe. 
The second and very much unforeseen path was to ditch every one of your pledges made previously, alienate the unions and strikers across the country, expel every Labour member that was slightly to the left of Ed Miliband, openly admit that you will continue some of the worst Tory policies in history and actively provide a safe haven for disaffected Tory voters instead of giving left-wingers and non-voters something hopeful to think about that would encourage them to make a trip to the ballot box. And trust me, we are definitely going to do a deep dive into the policies this week Labour is offering to the vote in public, but that will come in part three. Now, if you were presented with those two paths as the newly elected leader of the Socialist Labour Party, you would clearly go down the first path, wouldn't you? I mean, it's definitely a no-brainer, but this donkey decided to walk down the second path like he was being ridden by a person with a broken compass. But if we truly studied his past, especially while he was director of public prosecutions, this heel turn wouldn't have come as a surprise to any of us. So now we are at a point in history where Keir Starmer, who for the record sat within Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet, is giving speeches where he is trying to tie together and intersect Jeremy Corbyn, anti-Semitism and left-wing Labour members he no longer needs now he is in power and thus say with his chest they are no longer welcome within the Labour Party and should just go. The Labour Party is unrecognisable from 2019 and it will never go back. It will never again be a party captured by narrow interest. It will never again lose sight of its purpose or its morals. And it will never again be brought to its knees by racism or bigotry. Jesus <clears throat> Christ. I mean, it's not even that hard. Type in something like, I don't know, Labour Manifesto 2019. And what you will find is a 107 page document offering policies on the environment, all of our public services, tackling poverty and inequality, having a final say on Brexit, and what type of player the UK under a Labour government would look like on the international stage. Hardly narrow interests. Wanting to protect foxes from hunting and badgers from culling is really immoral. Oh my god, the evil bastards wanted to abolish tuition fees, provide free broadband by 2030, and extend statutory maternity pay from 9 to 12 months. Luck. And don't worry Keir, I'm gonna get to your racism and bigotry in a moment. But I still can't get over the fact that he is so proud that the Labour Party today is very different to the Labour Party in 2019. And this is in every shape and form from top to bottom. So in your mind, you believe that you tackled the systemic issue of anti-Semitism with the Labour Party, looked around and said, yeah, those policies gotta go as well. Oh, the largest membership for any political party in Europe. Who really needs that? Tony Blair was put out in the cold while Jeremy Corbyn was leader. I will make him my new mentor. Everything about the current Labour setup is nasty. But that hasn't stopped Keir Starmer appearing on national news with his gender swapped doppelganger giggling about how fantastic things are today within the Labour Party. But there's beyond the um, the relationship which is strong, we work together, we think together. We have together changed the Labour Party. Yeah. Um, and the Labour Party now um, is a completely changed party to the party that lost so badly in 2019. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it right now. If Keir Starmer becomes Prime Minister, he is going to change the rules within the Labour Party so that no other left-wing candidate will ever become a Labour leader again circling back to the racism and bigotry for a moment Sir Keir Starmer did something absolutely hilarious he commissioned an inquiry after leaked private whatsapp messages revealed factionalism within the Labour Party stopped it tackling anti-semitism properly that report completely destroyed what Keir Starmer knew, believed and was sane about the Labour Party so he completely ignored it. And then we had this moment in time where the author of that report was appearing on different news outlets saying Keir's just not returning my calls anymore. Following on from this report, black Labour MPs use anonymity to share their frustrations with Channel 4 News. Despite our party's claim to be anti-racist, we, our members and supporters, are losing faith in the ability and commitment of this leadership to tackle the issues raised in the Ford report 
and we demand urgent action. Now, unless I fell into a coma, this statement wasn't addressed either. And taking David Lammy everywhere with you, like he's your favorite pair of cufflings, doesn't count as tackling the problem of anti-black racism within the Labour Party. For a party of equality and progressive politics that made specific promises to the black community, their members now waiting to see how and when those promises will start to bear fruit. Now you can call me ungrateful if you want, but it doesn't help me sleep at night when I see a picture of Keir Starmer taking a knee while glaring down into the camera with a face that screams, if this gesture isn't good enough for you, I will just eat your face instead. Also, I clearly remember when Keir Starmer referred to the whole Black Lives Matter movement as a moment in time. So forgive me if I don't expect the man that can't get to grips with systematic anti-black racism within his own political party will be able to tackle the systemic issue of black people being seven times more likely to die after police restraint in Britain. He is given the same energy as American politicians that only offer hopes and prayers for victims of mass shootings instead of, you know, passing laws offering tighter gun regulation. Now, the reason that this is important is because Labour is recognised nationally as a anti-racist party. And something else that has just occurred to me just now is that we actually live in a world where the Tories can happily not be an anti-racist party and everybody's okay with that. But the label of Labour being an anti-racist party is often used as a stick to beat them when they are observed as not being anti-racist. This is why the establishment takedown of Jeremy Corbyn was so effective. And with today's Labour Party exhibiting behaviour of a hierarchy of racism, as highlighted in the Labour Files documentary. This hierarchy of racism within wider British society isn't anything new. One thing that I've noticed, because this has been really close to me in, in the last few weeks, where we've had um, a Tory councillor come out with incredibly Islamophobic comments and um, saying that 11-year-old girls should be frightened of Muslims. There's a mosque in his ward. And the lack of support that I've got on that, um, the lack of headlines, the lack of media, uh, even support from some of the Labour right, um, has demonstrated to me how racism is really being used as a political tool. Now, when you create a hierarchy of racism, you undermine all of us, and we should be working together to make sure that all types of racism are fought across all parties. And it's been incredibly upsetting to see the hypocrisy and double standards of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We should absolutely be heightening issues of anti-Semitism, and we should be doing the same for Islamophobia. It's a pretty serious indictment of the wider society in Britain and the Labour right all within one video. And of course you can think that this is anecdotal, especially when referencing wider society, but how does the author of the Ford Report describe how the anti-racist Labour Party views different types of discrimination? I mean, I chose my words quite carefully. What I said was that there seemed to be a perception of a hierarchy of racism and a perception that the sort of Me Too complaints and complaints of anti-Semitism were prioritised um, and that complaints in other areas, other, other types of racism either took overly long <clears throat> or were difficult to make. And if we are to follow the principles of the CAA Commission report, perception is everything. And it is the Labour leadership's job right now to alter perception. But I'm not exactly sure Keir Starmer has anything in mind to try and change perception. And this sentiment is echoed by Martin Ford QC himself. There's been slow progress. I mean, in fairness to the party, there were some changes made at the party conference before the report landed, like all reports. It's about implementation, so you can make recommendations, and if they're not implemented, then you know the, the, the report was pointless. So I'm, I'm keeping a kind of wary eye on what is and isn't done. In the interest of fairness, I better give you an update. An article printed in the Labour list in December 2023 states that Labour has implemented. 154 out of the 165 recommendations set out in the Ford report. Regardless of how I feel about Keir Starmer, the Shadow Cabinet and the Labour Party as it stands today, this has to be considered a good thing. And maybe Sir Keir Starmer isn't making a massive U-turn like he usually does and he is tacitly standing by a statement he has made in the past. And by me playing this clip doesn't mean I agree with his assessment of Labour under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. Never again will Labour allow hate to spread unchallenged. 
I just really hope he does challenge hate wherever he sees it beginning to spread. However, his unequivocal support of Israel's right to bomb the crap out of Gaza keeps the fire burning of the strong cynic within me and I find myself harbouring the same levels of scepticism as the black Labour MPs that spoke to the Channel 4 news programme. The black MPs I've spoken to don't want to speak on camera. They worry that if they do, they fear they'll lose the whip. But privately, one said to me that when it comes to anti-black racism, the party is lacklustre at best. Another said when it comes to progress, that the party was just going through the motions. It felt performative. And another really worried what this would do to the relationship between the Labour Party and the black community. Or maybe my fears are misplaced. With the Afrophobia and anti-black training package being the magical pill to solve all of Labour's problems. But who really knows? 2024 will surely be the year that will answer all of our questions. But one question which I don't feel will be answered in 2024 is the issue of democracy within the Labour Party. The attacks on democracy by Bolsonaro, Donald Trump, Erdogan, so many other forces around the world are well reported in the mainstream liberal media like The Guardian, like New York Times. Yet those same papers are remarkably silent on the attacks on democracy within the Labour Party. And in case you were wondering, Jeremy Corbyn is referencing the fact that he was expelled from the Labour Party and told that he will not stand as a Labour candidate at the next general election. A decision which seems to have been made unilaterally by Keir Starmer himself, with no transparency over what procedures were followed and what oversight was made from independent bodies. A decision which Sir Keir Rodney Starmer is more than happy to gloat about to anybody that would listen. The very first thing I said, Nick, when I became leader is I would root out anti-Semitism by its roots. I apologise for what had happened. I meant what I said. Um, and that is why Jeremy Corbyn lost the whip when he responded as he did to the terrible report on anti-Semitism okay. that we had and why when I won't stand as a Labour candidate. The establishment media from across the spectrum took zero notice of the findings of the Ford report, ignored the fact that the Labour Party took forever to even look at the recommendations, failed to ask the question as to why Sakir Vardy Starmer hasn't apologised for anti-black racism within the party and just look at him in amazement as he clearly says Israel has a right to commit genocide and then look at him in further amazement as he blatantly tries to rewrite history. This is the same establishment media that will laugh and joke with him at the World Economic Forum but go on to call Jeremy Corbyn a racist to his face. Is that I've been an anti-racist all my yes. life and, and I don't I dispute that but is it just possible I felt thought, often thought this at the time that maybe in a way because you know that because you are convinced of that you feel it in your bones it does blind you to a form of racism that perhaps you are not sufficiently alive to and that you know i feel that maybe if the lady of Deal were a muslim and he was saying that that maybe you would take it a bit more seriously than you do the, 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 that is a disgraceful thing to say to me. No, it's not disgraceful. No, I it don't is. Think I'm it sorry. Is. Lewis, I'm sorry. That is absolutely disgraceful. Now, one of two things are happening here. This journalist interviewing Jeremy Corbyn either doesn't do any research outside of learning the guest's name or is told exactly what to say by his paid masters. Regardless, his performance in this clip was just abysmal. How can you say in the same breath, I have no doubt that you have been a lifelong anti-racist and then go on to say in the next sentence, you are quite possibly blind to anti-Semitism and infer that Jeremy Corbyn has some type of special affiliation to Muslim people. I mean, Jesus Christ, I would have been turning over some tables in that room. I don't think I ever saw one reporter say to Boris Johnson, he might have a preference for white people and Chris Christians after comparing Muslim women to letterboxes and bank robbers. He was just simply urged to apologise. This is after Islamophobic incidents rose by more than 350%. All the while, Jeremy Corbyn is called an anti-Semite to his face, despite saying this in public. I want Jewish people to feel at home in the Labour Party and be able to play their full part in our campaigning work to take our country forward. I will continue working with the whole Jewish community to achieve this. It's my responsibility 
to root out anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. But I guess Jeremy Corbyn was given a lot less leeway than Boris Johnson because Jeremy Corbyn openly said he was going to actively dismantle the current establishment. Whereas Boris Johnson was doing everything within his power to uphold it and entrench it further. If you're one of those people that believe Boris Johnson being on the Brexit side of the EU referendum meant that he was anti-establishment, come here, I've got a secret to tell you. That whole saga was just establishment infighting and the rest of the country just became collateral damage. And in case you were wondering, sir, Keir Rodney Starmer is no threat to the establishment. At the CPS alone, he protected the police officer that killed an innocent Brazilian national and wanted to aid in a bet in the certain death sentence of one particular investigative journalist. He pushed for investigative journalist Julian Assange to be deported. He won't be making the decisions that will make your energy bills go down or provide more money in your monthly wage. If this was Hollywood, they would be calling Keir Starmer an industry plant. And the key role of an industry plant is to say at least one anti-establishment statement on their road to the top. This city has been wounded by the media, the sun in this city, a hurt for this city. And I certainly won't be giving any interviews to the Sun during the course of this campaign. I went to law school and this is the perfect sleaze bag lawyer response. Just listen very carefully to what he actually says. And I certainly won't be giving any interviews to the Sun during the course of this campaign. The most important words being during the course of this campaign, which conveniently leaves Sir Keir Starmer open to be given interviews to the Sun in any future campaigns. As a declassified article has already shown us, Keir being the little floozy we all thought he was, was wined and dined not by one, but two former Sun editors. And there is only evidence of him ever socialising with Sun editors as opposed to any other newspaper. The statement made on the election trail was just so smart because it relinquishes him of any responsibility if he was to ever get entangled with the Sun in the future. I absolutely guaranteed that Sir K. Rodney Starmer believed he was showing integrity here. I mean, come on, I was being very, very specific with my words. I bet he went home that night, looked in the mirror and said, you are a good man. It goes without saying, Keir Starmer did end up writing for the Son after he was elected Labour leader and it just takes your breath away in how he tries to dress up his lack of morals as something that will be good for the country in the long run. The definition of the ends justify the means. Sticking with Liverpool, you promised you wouldn't give interviews to the Sun in your 2020 leadership campaign. Can you tell people in Liverpool why you continue to write for a paper that is widely boycotted in the city? It is very important that we have a change of government so we can take our country forward. In order for that to happen... Why do you, why do you keep rising for the sun? In order for that to happen, I have to make sure that what we have to say is communicated to as many people as possible in the time that we've got available. Now, it's very clear from where I'm sitting that everybody in Liverpool was very upset with Keir Starmer's apparent switching attitude towards the Sun newspaper. Despite the journalist within this clip being from Liverpool, he was prevented from going full berserker on Keir Starmer because he was still an employee of the establishment media. But this doesn't mean that other citizens of Liverpool couldn't give him both barrels when they saw him in public. I don't know how you've got the guts to come to this city after you have been being interviewed and doing columns for the Sun newspaper, after the way we as a city were abused and after the way we as a city, the Hillsborough um, victims were abused by that paper and you've come here. I think it's safe to say if that woman hasn't already left the Labour Party on her own accord, she's probably been expelled by now. I think the point I'm trying to get at is despite the fact that Sir Keir Rodney Starmer was elected an MP for the first time in 2015, immediately walked into Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet. Now that he is leader, he has allowed himself to take off the mask and reveal to everybody his true authentic self. Writing 10 socialistic pledges while running for Labour leader and pandering to the sensitivities of Liverpudians is just something someone like him does to get to the top. If Keir Starmer wasn't a fan of Rupert Murdoch, why was he flirting with his empire the entire time he was DPP and only distancing himself when the phone hacking scandal came to light? I'm really starting to think that the whole reason behind him becoming a human rights lawyer was to offset every bad action he was going to do 
afterwards. Anyone tries to call him out on trying to send Julian Assange to his death in America, Keir Starmer can always fall back on the, oh, but I was a human rights lawyer. Choosing not to prosecute the police officer that murdered John Charles Domenez in cold blood. Oh, but I was a human rights lawyer. Co-signing the actions of Israel in the Gaza Strip. Oh, but I was a human rights lawyer. I have documented work of trying to abolish the death penalty in the Caribbean. This inbuilt excuse is amazing. I was watching a video after the death of Henry Kissinger and the person giving their reflections on Kissinger's life happened to be a professor. And this professor said, I usually don't speak on the death of anybody, whether they were good or bad, but they just had to speak about Kissinger because of all of the bad he had done. I was more focused on the reason they hadn't spoken about the deaths of people in the past. It was hard not to reduce a person down to their worst moment. Luckily, Henry Kissinger had so many bad moments that he was fair game. And I really like that quote. But I would add something else. We also shouldn't reduce someone down to their best moment. And I get the feeling that sometimes the supporters of Keir Starmer like to hold him up as this beacon of virtue simply because he was a human rights lawyer for a period of time, completely ignoring all of the lies and duplicitous acts he has done since then. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Keir Starmer was spotted living it up at the Rupert Murdoch big summer bash last summer because this is behavior he was used to while he was director of public prosecutions. Not to mention the fact that after he accepted a knighthood, Keir Starmer is very much aware of where power lies in this country and Keir has no interest in upsetting that apple cart, something Keir Starmer's predecessor was also very much aware of and chose that he was going to fight it instead. The media in Britain is dominated by two factors. One is the billionaire ownership of all of the major papers or the self-censorship by the so-called liberal media as well. When Keir Starmer supporters tell you he still harbours left-wing values because he edited some silly little Trotskyist magazine back in university, you can feel reassured that this isn't true when Keir says stuff like this out loud. I think that we can have clean power generation by 2030. We were already talking to CEOs and others about how we um, run towards that target. If we'd start on this road 10 years ago, uh, we wouldn't be reliant on oil and gas in the way we are. And renewables are nine times cheaper. And it means that we are not then um, in this unequal relationship with other countries, particularly who have human rights issues that are of concern and which we call out. The note I've put by this video is Keir Starmer enjoys talking to CEOs about meaningless schemes. Everything I dislike about Keir Starmer is wrapped up into this one video. Instead of telling us the who, what, when, why and where, he starts off about thinking about something, then talking to CEOs, something about oil and gas, complaining that other countries are doing better than us, but they have human right issues, which we definitely call out. And they had the audacity to put this out on the Labour YouTube channel. Can someone please explain to me why the hell this man is having in-depth and long conversations with CEOs? If CEOs cared one iota about the environment, why is their main mode of transport private jets? If CEOs cared about human rights, why aren't they doing more so that minerals from the Congo aren't extracted in the way they are? The sole objective of a CEO is to make as much profit as possible and they should not be anywhere near a person who hopes to be the Prime Minister of a country. Also this video illustrates that Keir Starmer is more concerned about what CEOs think than telling us that the ordinary person will have lower energy bills or that the planet will be safe to inhabit by future generations. Now compare this propagandized image of CEOs as being really good people and and it's essential that they have a place at the table when we are trying to draft any policies compared to how Jeremy Corbyn saw the ruling class. Very senior figures in the worlds of finance, of security, of foreign policy, of economic management that doesn't want a redistribution of power and wealth in our society. It is actually quite comfortable with the fact we've got more food banks than branches of McDonald's, that we now have the most unequal country anywhere in Europe and getting worse. Damn.
the best prime minister the working class never had in this country and he's definitely right there is a ruling class in this country that are absolutely comfortable with the level of homelessness the number of children that have to go to bed hungry and the number of young people that can't even take the first step onto the property ladder and it would seem that Keir Starmer is also happy with that reality to continue and the first step to making that happen was for Keir Starmer to change the Labour Party and mould it within his own image and this image is one that is happy for the Labour Party to be a very small tent, expulsion of left-wing members and a place for ex-Tory MPs and politicians that actually campaign to be Liberal Democrat elected officials. This party has now binned all of the socialist policies promised under Jeremy Corbyn. This party no longer has the largest membership in Europe, doesn't believe in supporting the rights of the working class to hold strike action, is happy with funding and seeing continuous war in Ukraine and historic Palestine, a party that is no longer a threat to the ruling class, whether it is media moguls, the House of Lords or the royal family. If you are a Keir Starmer supporter, that's very good for you. But I refuse to indulge in the myth that our political views are anywhere near each other. And I will no longer be shamed into thinking that I am a Tory enabler if I do not feel my vote is safe with the Labour Party under the current leadership. And I strongly suspect that if the Labour Party wins the next general election, it will have to remove Democratic Socialist Party from the back of its membership cards because everyone would have seen that they were only able to win an election in the last 50 years if they ditched all socialist principles and it just makes me sick to my stomach that a red party is being rewarded for being dirty little Tories. So that's the end of the video if you've made it to this point I cannot put into words how grateful I am please feel free to provide me with any feedback in the comments below if you enjoyed the video give it a like if you are new to the channel please don't forget to subscribe i got more videos on the way and if you're feeling extra generous please feel free to check out my patreon account i will be back soon for the final part in my starmerism series until that time ciao